Tom Goldsmith. I'm the grandson of Frank John William Goldsmith, third class survivor. He was traveling with his parents, Frank John Goldsmith and Emily Alice Goldsmith. Frank John died on the ship, Emily Alice was saved. They were traveling third class on the Titanic. My grandfather told me the story of his aunts and uncles and, and his grandparents living in Detroit at the time were sending letters to his parents trying to get them to emigrate to Detroit because the work was plentiful. My great grandfather was a uh, steam, uh, worked in a steam automotive plant as a machinist in England at the time and business was getting slow. So in these letters they would send my grandfather comic strips and one of the favorite comic strips he had was about cowboys and Indians. And with that, he decided one of the stories he would tell me was about a cap pistol. He decided he would trade his best top for a cap pistol that his neighbor boy had. When he showed his mother, his mother told him to get rid of it. She didn't want him to have the cap pistol. Well, they were packing at the time, and in the crate with her sewing machine, he put the cap pistol. My grandfather told me that he always figured they would find a way to find the ship, and when they did, they'd find a way to bring things back, and if they ever brought anything back, he wanted his cap pistol back. Now, he told me about this in segments. Uh, I would follow him around whenever we visited, and he would tell me this story. And that's one of the things he would tell me about. Another thing that he would tell me about is his time on board running around with the children of his age. And one of the things he would talk about was one day when they were playing on deck, they decided they were going to uh, see who could go hand over hand over this hatch on the cable. Well, unbeknownst to the boys, this cable was greased like most things on the ship that is exposed to elements. So when he got done, he was the only boy to do it, by the way. His hands were so full of grease that he almost missed dinner because his mother had to scrub them so hard. This, uh, this cabin was done up for a third class. And what he, uh, he told me was there was a sink in the class, but it may have been just a wash basin. And this is similar to what he traveled in. Him and his family were not steerage. They were third class and they had their own cabin, which was across the hall from second class, as he put it. It was just him and his parents that were in this cabin. On the night that the Titanic hit the iceberg, he had gone to sleep at normal time, about 8.30, 9 o'clock. And he said what woke him up was his mother dressing him. He estimated that time to be about 1.30. He said his parents told him what woke them up was not the crunching of the iceberg, but the silence, because in this area, it was towards the stern, and you could hear all the motors and the, and the turbines running, and you could hear the screws going around, and much like they've simulated here today. And he said the silence is what woke his parents up. And a little while later, he said the ship's surgeon came and rapped on the door and told him they should get their life jackets on. He said that uh, his father had gone forward because there were two male passengers that were traveling with the family, Thomas Theobald and Alfred Rush, and his father had gone forward to find them and bring them back to the cabin. And when they got back to the cabin, they all made the trip to the lifeboat deck. They actually didn't all make it to the lifeboat deck because of the way they had to go, but he said they traveled up through the second class dining saloon, crossed across it to the port side, and came to a gate. And at this gate, the crewmen were allowing the women and children only to go up to the lifeboat deck. At that point, it's when his father told him, so long Frankie, I'll see you later, and patting him on the shoulders. It's the last time he saw his father. Thomas Theobald took off his wedding band and handed it to my great-grandmother and said, if I don't make it, see that my wife gets this wedding band, which she did in the summer of 1912. There, a young man named Alfred Rush that was traveling with him, he was, uh, his birthday was April 14th. He had turned 16 on that day. In those times, 16 was a rite of passage to manhood. Up until then, you could only wear knickers. And he, at 16, you were allowed to wear long pants. 
The crew tried to grab him and pull him through the gate to the lifeboats, and he yanked his arm back and said, no, today I am a man, I will stay with the men. At 16 years old, he made a life and death decision. On the way up to the lifeboat, my grandfather said that the, the crew was linked arm in arm and made a passage to get to the lifeboat. And that at one point, a man tried to jump through the line and get in front of my grandmother, or great grandmother, who shoved him back, and the crew cheered for her. He talked about seeing the distress rockets going off over his right shoulder and going to the last lifeboat, Collapsible D. He said on the way down, his mother uh, held his head against her chest so he couldn't see the ship going down when they hit the water. But at one point, a woman in the boat said, oh, look, she's going to float. And that's when the stern had settled back onto the sea because when they were in the water, they paddled around to the stern around the backside. He said that the s stars were so bright and there was no moon and the night was so dark that the only way they could see the ship was when it blotted out the stars before it sank. Now my gra grandfather told that he, him and his mother always felt the ship broken too, which was something they didn't learn until after his death. And so he, he had always kept track of from 1912 on, newspaper clippings, articles about the Titanic, things that were going on about the Titanic. So he would tell me these stories whenever we visited. He told me about life on the Carpathia and going with a fireman from the Titanic named Sam Collins who befriended him. And that Sam Collins used to come and visit him up until 1914 on the day that his mother remarried. I have to stand on my tippy toes even to get close. I see him right there. And then my great grandfather is right here.